Well, here we go. Here we go. How many of you have heard me speak before? Oh, God, it's going to be so boring for you <laughs> lot. Never mind, never mind. I, we're starting with me because I, I want to show you what can be done in National Health Service in 10-minute appointments. This is kind of proof of concept. So we, we have been uh, doing a low-carb approach in my practice in Southport for 10 years, just over 10 years uh, now in 10-minute appointments. The reason we did it was because if we were being honest, we knew that everything seemed to be getting worse. Everything seemed to be getting worse. And my work as a doctor was so depressing. And I remember just pressing the button. You know, for doing repeat prescribing, all the drugs going out, everyone's a little press, press, press. It's so, can you imagine? I'd spend an hour and a half. Press, press, press. Ev even every one of those is a prescription. We were giving out more and more drugs. But the results were so disappointing. So disappointing. I n just never saw people look really healthy. And we, we faced a thing. So when I was a young man, uh, we had 57 people with type 2 diabetes in 1986. In the same practice, the same population, we've now got, I think it's about 550. Now that's happening in Edinburgh, that's happening in Glasgow. It's at least as bad as that in Scotland. So we, my practice has a nine-fold increase in the numbers of people with poor metabolic health, diabetes, obesity, high blood pressure. And it was against that backdrop of despair that we thought, well, we're not going to wait till somebody tells us how to sort this. We're going to do something, anything that works. And this is kind of the story of, of that, how we went from, uh, I was ready to retire, I was 55, uh, like all the GPs, I was going to go, and I'm still there now and they can't get rid of me. So something has changed. I'm loving medicine, absolutely. And now, uh, my favorite patients, uh, I love it when somebody, a new patient comes in and they've got poorly controlled type 2 diabetes, I'm e actually excited because I know I can help, I can do something. That, whereas before, they were my least favorite patients. And in fact, they were so much my least favorite patient. I was senior partner, so I got the junior partner, Dr. Simon Tobin. And I said, you know, I've been thinking about diabetes. It's a great thing for you to get your teeth into, <laughs> which is just, I just offloaded it. I just thought I'm not doing it anymore. And then, of course, I got all excited and, I, and now we do it jointly. So I, we're doing it jointly, but he's my boss now because uh, I'm not a partner anymore. I work for him so I can devote myself to this. So I need to crack on because I get too chatty. That's who I am. That's fine. So we're going to talk about, um, so I'm passionate about drug-free type 2 diabetes remission. How wonderful if people don't need drugs for their diabetes and can have good diabetic control. And we've been doing that in the practice, but also around the world. All sorts of other initiatives are going on all around the world. Uh, so it's, it's really exciting to what predicts remission in, in the population. What? Who are the people going to get it? But also, what happens to the ones who don't? I'm always being asked that. That's a worry, isn't it? If you don't get remission, is that terrible? Are you going to be ill? What's going to happen? So that's what this is about. Um, I try really hard to publish what I do. So this, most of today's talk is covered in BMJ Nutrition. It's an open access paper, so all of you can read that paper. I've stuck everything in there everything that you might need to replicate what I do, particularly if you look in the supplementary file. This is a paper I wrote, some of you will know Professor Roy Taylor, probably from a direct study. So this was, uh, this was a joint thing between Roy Taylor and myself. It's open access, and it's open access because the Public Health Collaboration, our charity, costs about £3,000 so that you don't have to pay to read that paper. And that's one of the charitable things that the PHC does. It pays for papers that might be useful to the general public so you can access them. This is the agenda, just so you know whether it's worth, you can go now, you know, if you want. 
why is it important to improve diabetic control? What is drug-free type 2 diabetes remission? And how can you all see it either for yourselves or in your clinics? I'm seeing it in every single clinic I do now for years. And you can too. It's not difficult. It's really simple. How do we help people understand the physiology of type 2 diabetes? So for me, rather than patients memorizing diet sheets, I think it's so much better if they can understand what the problem is, because then they can individualize the theory to the way they eat. No to, there is no such thing as the low-carb diet or any diet. My wife and I don't have the same diet. No two people in this room have an identical diet. We're all individualizing our diet according to what works or what doesn't work. So understanding the principles behind what you do is fundamental. It's fundamental to that individualization. Yes, uh, the results. You want to know about the results. If you're running a practice, what might you be able to achieve? As I say, I'm trying to give you this as proof of concept uh, so that you can see, well, I could do this too. And then we're going to uh, reveal what predicts drug-free remission, what happens to the ones who don't. And then some talk about making the approach sustainable. There's no point in doing stuff if a year later they've gained all the weight or gone back to it. There's no point. Primary care is the perfect place for something that's sustainable because we have continuity of care. Uh, and that's, that's why I'm a GP, because I love continuity of care. <coughs> right, get cracking. So here's a study. This is about why, why does diabetes matter? Looked at uh, 111,000 patients. And they were looking, we're looking at mortality, like death, that, that really matters. So... Uh, these are the hazard ratios. So having high blood pressure increases the mortality uh, hazard ratio by 38%. Smoking, 67%. In this study, diabetes was the worst of all three. So that was increasing the risk by 88%. Diabetes really does matter. It really does matter. Um, we're going to talk about some of my patients. Each of them has consented uh, to this, and in fact, they're proud. So here's Dan. He's about 40. His hemoglobin A1C there is 95. Now, the hemoglobin A1C is the average sugariness of his blood. 95 to the clinicians in the room is sky high. Mainly, you're reaching for the prescription pad when you see that. You're panicking. Panicking. 95 and he's young uh, you, he's got a bit of a weight problem there and he has high blood pressure he's on the maximum dosage of perindopril at eight milligrams so his metabolic health is generally wrong and this is why it really matters so this is from the uh, uk national diabetes audit and office of national statistics for both type 1 diabetes and type 2 Every year that you have a hemoglobin A1C of above 58, remember Dan was 90, you're losing a third of your life expectancy. That is terrifying. A third of your life expectancy. Blood pressure doesn't do anything like that. And this is a national figure. So we need to help Dan. Because he's young. So he's got a long time to be losing life expectancy. That's the, the reference for that. So uh, I don't know the data for Scotland, but in England, right at this moment, there are a million people with poorly controlled diabetes. This is how bad it is. A million people are losing a third of their life expectancy. It's just more than a third of everybody with diabetes. And I believe Scotland will be as bad. It may even be worse. I don't know. But the clinicians in the room will know. So having sugary blood, I'm bringing sugar into the conversation as early as possible. So we've talked about the hemoglobin A1C is the average sugariness of your blood. So having sugary blood 
is bad for Dan. Now, uh, Dan, on that very day when he came to me, is interested in a drug-free approach. But we need to set Dan's expectations. Is Dan going to, if he tries hard, is he going to get drug-free remission or not? Because if we set expectations incorrectly and he fails, he'll just be disappointed. So it's the framing of people's expectations is quite important. So that's why predicting who will get re, uh, remission and who won't is clinically really interesting. Because then we can give people the right kind of hope. Hooray! There you go. That, that graph, on angels in heaven are singing about that graph. Look at it. So what you've got there, the hemoglobin A1C sky high, 95. And rapidly, rapidly, his hemoglobin A1C drops. And he sustained it for several years. So that is drug-free type 2 diabetes remission for somebody. What, what a difference that's made. And just look at him now. He's transformed. He's so proud. He's not a patient at all. He's off his blood pressure medication. He doesn't take any medication. He doesn't see me very often. He comes to our groups, but he's not really a patient. I, I happened to see him last week. Uh, but he's just getting on with his life. And his life's different. He now believes in himself. I think as a younger doctor, I medicalized many people without realizing. So what I did was I, I said, you know, you, your diabetes is a problem. You're in danger. Uh, you need to take this medication for the rest of your life. And ethically, I worry about that now because what I just did was medicalize that person because they haven't got any idea that they can make a difference. You know, my mother just thought if she took the metformin, she could eat as many cakes as she wanted or she'd take an extra metformin because she just thought, well, I'm taking my medication so it doesn't matter what I do. And that's really common in patients. But that, that is my fault because I medicalized them and I didn't, my mother did not understand the difference that her diet made, but Dan understands. And at the moment, within the practice, we've done this 127 times, week after week after week. And then round the world, uh, you're going to see more of my work, some of which is downloaded millions of times and in 17 languages. So this is spreading all over the world. But really, that my point is, I want it to spread to Scotland, please. And you could have such fun. It's so great. And there's many people in the audience who've done this already, I know. As I said, let's explain things in a way that our patients can understand. Few things. First of all, if we talk about the hemoglobin A1c as the measure, the average sugariness of your blood for the preceding three months, that gets any chat off to a sugary start, which is where, it, I've only got 10 minutes, we've got to crack on. Sugary blood. Why does diabetes, what do people die of? They die of heart attacks and strokes um, and cancer, actually, but that's another story. The thing is, sugary blood damages the lining of your arteries. In fact, there's a reference there, a, a really high blood sugar s um, spike damages your arteries. The non-stick lining of your arteries is called the glycocalyx, and that is damaged within six hours. So two things matter. One is avoiding spikes because that damages the glycocalyx, and the other thing is the average sugariness. So it's the average, but also time in range. Time in range that avoiding spikes is important. <coughs> Insulin. Nature has always thought it out. Always thought it out. So if a blood sugar is damaging, we were cleverly designed to have a hormone, insulin, which keeps it back in range. So insulin has a job to do, and the job is 
taking sugar out of the bloodstream where it does damage and getting rid of it anyway. And it does that by pushing it into muscles for exercise or that sugar gets pushed inside cells and it gets turned into fat. So insulin has a vital job to do. But of course that sugar gets pushed into cells and becomes fat and you end up with a big tummy or a fatty liver. And the fat that it is, the sugar is turned into a specific fat tr called triglyceride, which is important and I'll be talking about that later. So there we are, insulin doing its job, trying to push the sugar into liver cells, muscle cells and fat cells. But in the liver, it becomes fat and the fat in the liver interferes with the good work of insulin. So you become insulin resistant and the insulin doesn't work as well. So you can't control the blood sugar as well. And there's a 10 year gap. Roy Taylor calls it the long silent scream from the liver while your liver gradually fills with fat and your liver function deteriorates actually before your blood sugars climb. And that's why we talk about metabolic health and one of the important things is liver health triglyceride levels, that kind of thing. 20% of the entire developed world now has fatty liver. Silent screams that we're not listening to. And they're getting, in some of them are children, we are not listening. And for years I didn't know what to do with abnormal liver function in the practice. I knew there was about a third of all the blood tests I did were abnormal, but I didn't know why. Maybe they were all drinking, I, I don't know. But it's fatty liver, it's fatty liver. So, time for a bit of hope. That was enough misery. Um, so we know that if you reduce carbohydrate intake, you reduce circulating insulin, you reverse, you reduce liver fat, which improves insulin sensitivity. You reduce pancreatic fat, you increase insulin secretion. And this is how you get to put diabetes into remission. Again, this is work from Roy Taylor, medical school at Newcastle where he was scanning people's liver and pancreas when you change their diet. Let's be honest, there's different ways to reduce carbohydrate intake. Bariatric surgery works really well, works very rapidly. There is the low carb diet or there is the diet, the shakes and the soups, the direct study. I don't know whether that's come to Scotland or not yet, but it will be, it will be. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, it is here, the Cambridge diet. So the, there are three different ways. The question is, as a patient, which would you prefer? Bariatric surgery, it does work. But, I, you know, some of those people die. And it's not easy for them. It's, it's a complicated thing. The, the shakes and soups, well, that works as well. But you still have to learn how to eat differently because you can't live on those forever because that diet doesn't give you enough to live long term. So there's... It's a matter of which would suit the patient in front of you. So first hint. So it's kind of we're looking at a, a, a high blood sugar. My wife is a psychologist, clever, clever woman. And, and she says, first of all, don't see patients as problems. That's a really negative thing to do. Because then they kind of shut off. And it's not collaborative. I like to work with patients. So see people, if you, if you can, as a, pu a puzzle to be solved rather than a problem. And I think I did the problem thing for a very long time. And then when people didn't come back, I, <laughs> I was annoyed with them. <laughs> you know, then some of them would go away for several years because I used to do a big thing about, well, you'll die. <laughs> You know, well, you know, you'll die. You need to do, you take your medication, do this, do that. And what I'd missed, that there was a, so all these people were annoying me uh, by either going away and not coming back or they didn't take my advice. And it's odd, isn't it? And I had missed the fact that I was the common denominator. <laughs> so I blamed the patients, which, uh, you know, that, that felt comfortable. It's obvious, isn't it? And I, I think that's quite common. I think that's really common that we blame the patients when things don't work. 
And so if we keep doing the same thing and it doesn't work, we need to do something different. And I was very slow to wake up to that. I was 55 before I had my eureka moment. And I just did the same thing, come just blame the patients because they're lazy and they don't listen and that kind of thing. And what I've discovered now is they really do listen and they are interested in being healthy. They don't want to be ill. They just don't. Anyway, see, it really helps that conceptual change of the idea that this is an interesting puzzle. Take the emotion out of it. High blood sugars. So what makes a high blood sugar? Well, it's what you ate. So we talk on and on about exercise and so on, other things. Now, 95% of a high blood sugar is what you ate. And anybody with a freestyle Libra knows that that's mainly true. There are other things that put blood sugar up. So um, stress does. COVID was terrible for this. Illness. And then there's the dawn phenomenon. So some people with diabetes have a high blood sugar and they've not eaten anything. But that aside, mainly a lot of high blood sugars are what you ate. When you see that spike on a freestyle Libra, what did you just eat? And they've always just had a bowl of cornflakes or, you know, whatever. Questions are more powerful than statements. So you're saying to the patient, you're very, Dan, blimey, you're sugary. Where did that come from? Now, some people know, and that's clearly where they need to begin. Um, Dan didn't know, really. Uh, and that was because he'd missed out on... Uh, the starch molecule. And to be honest, I had missed out on the starch molecule because I, for, until I was 55, I never taught bread, breakfast cereals. It never, I just talked about sugar. Why? Why? I was asleep. What's going wrong? How did I never think of bread as sugar or rice? I don't know. Uh, but anyway, for Dan, uh, bread was kind of one of his major things and chips and I think rice and some of the things he drank. Um, so there we are. Then we're coming now. Some of you will know or everybody on your uh, chair has got a one of these, which is coming up next. So I wanted my patients to understand where their sugar came from. And I used to talk about the glycemic load and the glycemic index, but the patients didn't understand it. Even my own partners didn't understand it. So I had to come up with a way to help people understand the glycemic consequences of dietary choices. And so I thought, well, why don't I do redo the calculations of the glycemic load in terms of something my patients do understand, which is a teaspoon of sugar. My patients didn't understand grams and they didn't understand glucose, but they do understand teaspoons of sugar. So you'll see here, the single fact that has done most good, I think that I've done around the world, is that a bowl of boiled basmati rice, 150 grams, is about the same as 10 teaspoons of sugar. And that has been downloaded millions of times around the world in 17 languages because suddenly people wake up to, wait a minute, it isn't just about sugar, rice, bread, potatoes, and even the hum humble banana there um, are all potential sources of sugar. And it really helps people individualize their diet. Now, these uh, infographics, oh, one other thing I should say, so. The logic of the low-carb diet is you can eat loads of tasty stuff that doesn't put up your blood sugar. So green veg, meat, fish, eggs, nuts, cheese, all of those things. That's the basis of the low-carb diet. And it's just logical. What are you going to eat? Do you want to eat something that poisons you or something that doesn't? Pretty simple, really. All of these... Everything that I do is uh, downloadable for free with no copyright from the Public Health Collaboration. Yes, um, I used to be a great believer in brown rice and brown bread. And I felt virtuous with my brown bread. And, uh, but actually, when I did the calculations, I was in for a surprise. And you'll see here that brown rice 
at 7.3 teaspoons isn't that much better than white. And the brown and white bread, again, it only makes a difference of about a quarter, so it does make a difference. But I would say in this whole brown or white thing, I'd say go green, use green veg and protein. But that, that surprised me, that surprised me. Um, I put this on really to help you understand the difference. So something made with white flour, 100 grams of white flour is the same as 13 teaspoons of sugar. But if you could use gram flour, that's the same as two teaspoons of sugar. So gram flour is a really great alternative made from chickpeas and it's got more protein. And um, of course, in India, they use gram flour. They know all about it. So it's very helpful if any of you have an Asian population. Gram flour is something they're really familiar with. And on there, you've got generally, it, people often ask me about vegetarian. You'll see that actually, the various uh, pulses and beans are they're not so bad really and they give more protein. That's the diet sheet which you don't need to memorize because I hope you understand the principles but also on your seat you've got this is what I give my patients. We've used this diet sheet for 10 years now and again you can steal it, uh, download it from the PHC and we don't need to talk about it now because you've got a copy you can, if you're interested you can read it. One of the things about low carb, if you're cutting out the carbs, well, you, something else is going up. And really, you've only got two things. So uh, the macronutrients, you could increase protein or you can increase dietary fat. Uh, one of the worries I had in the early days was, what if people increase fat, what happens to the lipid profiles? And will I kill my patients with heart attacks and strokes? So I kept really c careful data right from the very first on the whole lipid profile thing and blood pressure and cardiovascular risk. And Roy Taylor did this. This is, uh, this is looking at cardiovascular risk, really. So what makes up cardiovascular risk would be weight, hemoglobin A1c, triglyceride, blood pressure, cholesterol, and cholesterol HDL ratio. This is for 186 people in my practice who were low carb at this point for an average of 33 months, which is quite a long time. And it's great news because everything I measured improved significantly. So they, they lost about the weight. We had some amazing weight losses. I've got one boy that's lost 12 stone. In weight, I couldn't. In fact, we don't know what he has lost because he was too heavy to weigh at the beginning. We didn't have any anything that could m weigh him. I had to do it uh, with a tape measure around his waist, and he was the first day he could be weighed. He was cheering because that was his goal to be weighable. Can you imagine? That was his goal that he could be weighable. Uh, I'm so proud of that boy. He was only 28, had sleep apnea as well, and everything, all sorted, of course. And he's he does running now. Isn't that amazing? 20, he's a miracle. That's a case that makes me just so happy. Uh, I look forward to seeing him. Anyway, I'm di chatting on too much. Hemoglobin A1c, look at that. So on average, it's improving by just under 27, just under 30 percent, 27 percent. So the average improvements in hemoglobin A1c are huge. Triglyceride improves by more than a third. The triglyceride, I love those, they really drop. And actually triglyceride HDL ratio is a really good marker for cardiovascular risk. So these improvements in triglyceride are really interesting and significant. Blood pressure, if I come back next year, I'll tell you all about insulin, sodium and blood pressure. 20% um, of all the people on medication for their blood pressure got to come off it because the blood pressure improved so much they felt dizzy when they stood up. But that's another complete other talk. Cholesterol down, cholesterol ratio. So it isn't just diabetes, uh, cardiovascular risk, those are all the markers uh, that Roy Taylor could think about. Really significant improvements at nearly three years. Proof of concept. Meanwhile, meanwhile, uh, the pharmacist came to me a few years ago and she said, what's happening? 
because we're not doing nearly so much business. What's happening, and there is national data collected on every GP uh, open prescribing, and if you look, if you compare our practice to all the surrounding practices, we're spending £68,000 per year less than our neighbours on drugs for diabetes. That's a lot. And of course, if you keep approaching people like Dan and saying, shall we start metformin today or do you want to do something else? And I have asked that question every single patient for 10 years and not one patient, not a single patient in 10 years has said, I'll take the drugs, Dr. Omin. Not one. So what, what about all the patients I saw in the 25 years before that I was drugging up? I never gave them the chance. And then I'm annoyed with them afterwards. It's like shocking, isn't it? But I'm awake now. And if I ask my patients, which would you prefer to do today? Because I'll support you either way. I'm quite interested in weight loss. Uh, we could do that. And they are interested. What is remission? Uh, it's really useful to, we now have an inter international classification for remission, so we know what we're talking about. Previous diagnosis of type 2 diabetes by WHO criteria, hemoglobin A1c under 48 for three months of obviously no diabetes medications either. This is going on around the world. It's not just me. Um, so you've got direct study. This is Roy Taylor's people. Actually, there's Mike Lean in Glasgow as well. I don't know where some of you might know Mike Lean. So it's Mike Lean as, as well as Roy. They're doing the direct stuff in Glasgow and Newcastle. Uh, there's a publication at 24 months. They had 53 people in remission out of 149. So they're doing really well. That's the 36% remission rate. So that's doing it in a different way. Verta, um, Verta, a very dynamic group in San Francisco. They're doing this through employers. So they're offering to employers um, the idea that your staff could live longer and be less sick if, if we do this low carb thing. And they, they've got like billions invested. I've been and seen their operation. I've been their guest, it's amazing. They're doing huge things. Insurance companies are coming on board in America now. So Verta, there we are. There was their last published 24 months. They had 68 out of 194, so it's 35. And then at Norwood, uh, at that point, it was an average duration of two, 28 months, and that was 127. So we're getting 50%. So 50% of all the people that go, I'd like to try low carb, are getting remission. That's pretty good. In fact, it's really exciting. Yeah, but what happens to the other 50%? Because if they die, if they're all buried under the patio, then it's maybe not so good. So we ought to just check on them. So here we are uh, looking at it in a different way. Again, those 186, these are all the patients that have consented. They're part of the research group. We have done more than that in the practice, but you have to consent them so they that's what I've got consented at the moment. So what you've got there, uh, in the blue, at that point, this is the publication, there were 94 of them, that was, at, was 51%. But in, in the rest, in the 49%, only 3% had worse diabetic control. So actually, the great majority, 97% of those 186 patients ended up with better diabetic control. There's only five of them that didn't. It's very interesting. Why did those five? And that could be another talk because I'm really interested in failure and why doesn't this approach work for some people? It's really interesting. But when it, when it comes to what happens to those that don't get remission, uh, there's hope there as well. So what predicts remission? Now this really amazed me. Christine is in the, Christine, where are you? Christine uh, does the stats for me and she's an unsung hero because she works quietly and has done for years and helped and helped and helped. Doesn't get any payment for all the hours and hours that she spends. In fact, you should have a round of applause right now. <laughs> Christine, thank you. Thank you. But I was so excited when, when we did the stats because I had missed stuff. I had missed stuff. 
So what we were looking at was if you divide all 186 into who got remission and who didn't. So you've got two, but then go back to the baseline data on both groups. Was there anything different about the baseline data of the groups? And there was. So the remission group had an average duration of their diabetes of just two months compared to 72 months in the remission group. The p-value, I think it had 50 noughts. You're only supposed to, I've spoiled myself there, you're only supposed to put two, but I, I'm given in. I could have had 50 noughts. There was loads and loads of noughts. They are so different. So, and then if you look here on the right, we're looking at, they're, we, they're divided up. This is year by year of the baseline data and what happened to them. So the ones who had had diabetes for less than a year, 77% got remission. So young diabetics are a wonderful, not young chronologically, but young metabolically, are a wonderful window of opportunity. I hardly miss any. So motivated. 77% as an, as, a, as an intervention. But over time, it's not quite as good. But what a shame. That means we, I've missed a window of opportunity because as their metabolism ages, they, they don't do as well. So I think that's really, really important, and I had completely missed it until we, this is the value of a medical statistician, really, because I had, you can miss stuff very easily. Here's another thing you can do. So you're only diagnosed with diabetes on the second raised hemoglobin A1C. So this is somebody that comes to me, I, they've got a raised hemoglobin A1C, why do we let them get to a second raised one? Why don't we head this off? And people are so interested. If you say, right, you've got the first one, how about we don't let there be a second high one? Are you up for something? They're really, really motivated. And then they don't get coded as diabetic, so they're better for insurance, they really love it. You have to keep an eye on them though, because they are vulnerable. But there's one that I headed off. And here's another one. But this is somebody I headed off years ago. So I'm showing you, this is again, proof that it can last. Uh, so that was 2016 with a raised one. But look how I've kept that, or not me, how the patient has kept that within the normal range ever since. So that isn't actually remission because they never got diagnosed as diabetic. It's better, isn't it? They're not diabetic. Really great, really great. So the really interesting question in clinical terms is how do we support this process of maintenance? Because it's absolutely key. Loads of people can lose weight. You've got to think personally and clinically how to support people's efforts over time. So we, uh, and do it economically, so we run groups. So we, we, for 10 years, we've been running groups because it's cheaper. And it uses up the waiting room when the, in a Monday evening. And that's where the public health collaboration uh, ambassadors can come in because I've got one, Nicola, and she works, helps me for free because you can't really run a group by yourself. So groups are a great way to support people over time. And again, if I had longer, I could talk about that. It's, I was frightened of doing groups, but actually it's fun and you get patient experts and I don't have to solve everybody's problems. Other people will say, well, I do this. Why don't you do that? Patients will help each other. Dan. So it's about this window of opportunity, but what happens to the others? So this is a second message of hope, which is the, what happens to the people with longer, last, longer established diabetes they're different too. So when we went back to the baseline data, they have, if you look at the, this is the baseline there for the ones who get remission, and this is the baseline for the ones who are not going to get remission. I think my battery is probably there. But look, so this is the hemoglobin A1C. So the ones who are not going to get remission start off with much, much worse diabetes. 
which is kind of logical. So you can't be surprised when they don't... So going below this line is remission. So there is the remission group who are nearly all in remission under there. There is the ones who don't get remission. But their average improvement in hemoglobin A1c is greater. So here was a second lovely surprise that yes, the non-mitigation, sorry, the non-remission group don't get remission clearly by definition, but they get a better improvement in their diabetes in terms of hemoglobin A1c than the remission group. So you see, that's why the framing is so important. So if I've got somebody who's had diabetes for 10 years with really po poorly controlled diabetes, I'm, I'm not talking remission. I'm saying I'm really excited because I think we could really improve this diabetes, you know. I don't talk about remission because then they'd be disappointed. I don't want them to be disappointed. But I'm really excited by, look at that, in terms of a population change. So there's the... The little red dot is the mean, that's the median, those are the confidence intervals. They're a completely different population after 33 months. So mitigation matters. And it matters because these are the group that are losing their life expectancy. Aren't the ones with poor control are the ones losing life expectancy. So mitigation is worth fighting for, really. Another patient, Marcia. Here's Marcia. Uh, again, consented. Age 52, she weighs about 100 kilos. She's been on a high dose of insulin since 2004. Three injections a day. So uh, she walks with a stick. She has chronic pain. Her life's very difficult. She, of course, has high blood pressure. The clinicians in this room, you've all got people like Marcia. You recognize her. Uh, she's struggling. She takes a long time to get into your room from the waiting room because coming along the corridor takes her ages. And her life is hard, really hard. And for her diabetes, her experience of diabetes is that it's a chronic deteriorating downward trajectory. So she's a bit depressed. And no wonder. But there's Marcia now. That's mitigation for you. No stick been off insulin for two years. So she was on insulin all those years for no reason, wasn't she? Because she doesn't need it now, and she's older. So whoever put Marcia on insulin was well-meaning, but years later she's been off it for two years. And of course, she, her blood pressure sorted out, and uh, she's not taking medication. Now, the reason her hemoglobin A1c is actually 47, but she still takes um, a metformin, about alternate days. So she hasn't got remission, but she doesn't care what we call it. She's taking metformin, well, that's, that's fine. She's astonished to be off insulin. What happened with Marcy was interesting. Uh, English isn't her first language, she's from Brazil. And I think we had all underestimated her intelligence. I think that's what had happened. And actually, once she understood what I was telling you earlier on about insulin, she just knew what to do. She just hadn't got the model in her mind. And in Brazil, they eat a lot of meat, apparently. So her, um, her culture, she knew what to eat. So she just went back to how her grandma ate. And, and the results are amazing. So that's kind of my model now. Over time, it's about metabolic age, not about chronological age, because you're metabolic age goes up, you're more likely to get mitigation and less likely to get remission. Oh yes, triglycerides. Triglycerides. I've just put this in for Mahone, the idea of triglycerides. So this is the same person over the same period of time. Triglyceride, 2010 to 2022 and hemoglobin A1c. And I hope you can see how those two graphs match each other. Triglyceride is absolutely a really good marker, fasting triglyceride, of metabolic health. And it improves. The, of course, the thing is, triglyceride improves very rapidly. Hemoglobin A1c is a slower moving ship. So that's the graphs are not the same because uh, hemoglobin A1c is a three-monthly thing. Triglyceride is varying from day to day. But 
you can see how similar they are. That was somebody whose triglyceride was way out of control, and so was the hemoglobin A1C. Now, nothing's happening, and I... Could somebody just advance? I wonder if the battery's gone on this. Yeah. We're coming to the end. Uh, so, think about feedback. We, we're, we're in this, how do we... How do we manage maintenance. So you have to know how you're doing. So what form of feedback suits each of you? You'll have to click it on again. I'll do click. Click. <laughs> so this guide, two things of feedback there. Uh, one is the EMIS computer system produces graphs, which he loved. But what he prefers is he's got his belt. So he always wears that belt and he's showing you where the hole used to be for his belly. That's also another form of feedback. Feedback is key to behavior change, and we need to think about behavior change if you're going to manage populations over time. Next. Oh, this is an important warning, an important warning to clinicians. If you have a hemoglobin A1C like that that has jumped up to 120, there is a very rare circumstance where that is really dangerous and that low carb is not the answer. I tell you, I'm going to give you the answer rather than tease you for a moment. Clinicians, what, what, what would be a cir circumstance where hemoglobin A1C is going up, but if weight is coming down, that's weird. Because normally, pardon? Yes, well done. It can be, and if you do hundreds, sooner or later you'll find a pancreatic carcinoma or a misdiagnosed type 1. Either of those, or another one was a colonic carcinoma. So everybody in the team needs to know if you've got hemoglobin A1C jumps but weight comes down, weird. Call for help. Weird. Next. But actually relax. Ha, ah, It's okay. This person's uh, weight wasn't uh, going down. And it's another good example of mitigation. And again, most clinicians at 120 are panicking and reaching for the prescription pad. That particular person in the dietary history, they were just eating loads and loads of sugar, so I didn't panic because I knew that that would happen. But obviously, I keep an eye on them. Next. And how I keep an eye on them is the Freestyle Libra. So if we've got time, I'd love to show you some Freestyle Libra stuff. Next. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Right. So I had somebody last year, 59-year-old, started by the hospital on insulin for his type 2 diabetes. His wife said, um, couldn't we just eat less carbohydrate? And they said, no, no, you need insulin lifelong. And, and, the, and the wife said, but his breakfast is just full of sugar. And the nurse said, no, just cover it with insulin. That's why we've given you the insulin. So she came to see me afterwards. I gave them Freestyle Libra, and that's the baseline. Those three are his baseline blood sugars. The yellow bit was if it was in range, and above that, you can see it's never in range. So it's even with the insulin, his blood sugar was way out of control. If you just do the next one. And his hemoglobin A1C was 91 on his insulin. Right. So the next stop. So there is, that was the 6th of October. And on the 9th of October, I told him about low carb. And you can see transformed in days in days <laughs> like they just got it and his blood sugar was normal but you need to reduce the insulin uh, so the next couple so during those here in early October I'm cutting the insulin by 50% 50% 50% and of course he, he was off all his insulin uh, by November the 20th and his hemoglobin A1C is still within range Next, there's one last one, I think. So that now he's transformed from using insulin, blood sugar just out of control because he was just trying to use the insulin to cover his carby breakfasts to superb control of insulin. I've saved the government money. He is so proud because imagine living with injecting and all of, the, all of that. He can go out. He doesn't have to worry. Um, so... Uh, freestyle Libra for type 2 diabetes, I broke the rules. 
but who cares? Who's going to, you know, you'll visit me in prison when I go. be fine. <laughs> Next. Hemoglobin A1C, 53. Oh, we, we really are coming to the end now. I keep saying this. The uptick. Part of maintenance is spotting. You see that little uptick in weight? It's never innocent. It's never innocent. That's Christmas or our so-and-so had a birthday or you've been on a cruise or you've done act. Ask and act. So even though the hemoglobin A1C looks good and they're in remission, if, I don't, if they're drifting, that won't last. And it, part of, you have to give that feedback. That's how we learn from our mistakes. You went on that cruise, what would you do differently? Christmas, how would you do it differently? And that's how the work at Norwood Avenue, how our data continues to improve because we are learning and the patients are learning. We're all lifelong learners. All of us do stupid stuff. But do you do it again? No. Next, please. Loads of free stuff in the public health collaboration. Steal it, take it, the loads there. Uh, the diet sheets, the protocol, the doctor nurse protocol, sugar infographics, all that. Next, cantering. Oh yes, my wife. This is my lovely wife, consultant psychologist. Yes, she's written a book because we discovered that nearly all of the people that do badly, so many of them are carb addicts. And it's a really serious subject that we'd talk about next year. Uh, and it, they're not eating bread to annoy me. It's just, you know, why do intelligent people do, why do intelligent people drink? Why do intelligent people smoke? Well, they, do, they, are they, do they know it'll harm their health? Yes, they do. Who, who doesn't know that cigarettes harm your health and yet you still do it? There are people who eat and they know it's harming their health they do it and bread you would not believe how many people are addicted to bread until you start asking the question here's the book it's not the profit goes to the phc so you don't make me rich by buying that book if you're interested it's on kindle on amazon next i love this this is a free app so some young capable doctors down south took my work and turned it into an app. You can download it for free, no money involved, it works. And there's low budget stuff on there as well. They've vegetarian, it's all covered. The Freshwell Low Carb app, next. Uh, the final model for patients is think about if you had a barrel and the sugar going in and sugar going out and you want to maintain the level of sugar in the barrel, you've either got to stop the sugar going in or you've got to encourage it to come out if you want a low level. So yes, exercise gets rid of glucose, insulin, glycoside, SGL2 inhibitor drugs get rid of sugar. Uh, but a patient of mine said, why don't we just turn off the tap? Wouldn't that make more sense, really, than rushing around with buckets for all the mess that comes out? Next, turn off the tap, and patients get this. Yeah, which you can, fasting, very low-calorie diets, low-carb diet, bariatric surgery. Next. Not enough time, next. <laughs> Too boring. Uh, any dietitians in the audience at all? Da, I put that slide in for you and you nobody's here. The dietitians now are coming on board with this. This was published in the, uh, uh, by the British Dietetics Association, a review. Yes, they do like low carb and yes, it is safe. And yes, that's they, they invited that review and then published it in their own journal. But maybe you don't need that slide. Next. Oh, final patient. This is Brian. He's 82. I'm holding the tape measure where his belly used to be, and he was on insulin. So it's great for old people too. And the drugs aren't so safe for old people. So dietary, and they're all old people are organized. They're, they're organized, and they know how to cook, and they've got the time. So again, Brian's another one who was on blood pressure medication, of course, and he's off the insulin and off his BP's fine, and he's joined a gym. And there, you've come to the end. Well done. Congratulations. There we are. Thank you. Thank you.